with uh, uh, hard drugs. I have two bro uh, other brothers who had died with uh, alcohol. Uh, my sister just put a fire on, on her. She had been very discouraged with the life. She committed suicide. Yeah, yeah, suicide, yeah. In 1982, the Chagos Islanders, now desperate, demonstrated in the streets of Mauritius. This embarrassed the British government into giving them a derisory compensation, which came to less than £3,000 per person. This didn't even pay their debts, and to get this money, many believed they were tricked into signing away their right to return home. <laughs> It was entirely improper, unethical, dictatorial to have the Chagosian put the thumbprint on an English legal drafted document where the Chagosian, who doesn't read nor speak any English, let alone legal English, is made to renounce basically all his rights as a human being. Renouncing their rights was precisely what the British government wanted them to do. They could then be forgotten. That same year, the government spent two billion pounds defending the rights of the Falkland Islanders, who are white. My people, the Queen would say in a Christmas broadcast, so you send them 2,000 uh, 2, inhabitants of the Falklands, and you've got 2,000 people, Jagos, one out, the other one, we come to your rescue, come on. Come on, you are, you are all English, you're all British. <laughs> come on. What's the difference? Where's your sense of fair play, my, my fellas? <laughs> Where's your sense of fair play? From a tiny lockup in the poorest section of Port Louis, Mauritius, Olivia Bancor, an electrician, has taken the struggle across the world. And here you're with Nelson Mandela. Yeah, I, I am with Nelson Mandela, an example of, of, of human rights fighter, you see. Uh, we compare our struggle to the struggle of Nelson Mandela who had been... In the 1990s, the islanders' struggle took a dramatic turn with the discovery of these documents in the public record office in London. Here was the evidence that they and their supporters were looking for. These long-forgotten secret official files revealed the full scale of the conspiracy and the cynicism that drove it. The conspiracy got underway with the creation of a fake colony called the British Indian Ocean Territory, or BIOT. The sole purpose of creating this colony was to kick the people out. And to do it, the Foreign Office invented a fiction. They said the islanders didn't really belong to the Chagos, but were merely temporary contract workers. Foreign Office Memorandum, July 1965. People were born there, and in some cases their parents were born there too. The intention is, however, that none of them should be regarded as being permanent inhabitants of the islands. So how would they be regarded? The legal position of the inhabitants would be greatly simplified from our point of view, though not necessarily from theirs, if we decided to treat them as a floating population.
This long forgotten British government film shot in 1957 reveals the duplicity. Clearly, the Foreign Office knew the people of the Chagos were anything but temporary workers. Out of a total of 100 or more little islands, only some half a dozen are permanently inhabited, partly by people from Mauritius and the Seychelles, but mostly by men and women who have been born and brought up on these fragments of land. It is the story of their lives which this film tells. The British tried to claim and I, I just quote one of their documents, that the Chagos had no indigenous or settled population. Nachi, dame. Mon papa n'est là-bas, mon grand-père n'est là-bas, mon grand-mère n'est là-bas, mon maman n'est là-bas. Pour mentir. Il mentit, génération, est là-bas. Back in London, some officials began to worry about being caught out. Foreign Office Memo, November 1965. There is a civilian population. In practice, however, I would advise a policy of quiet disregard. In other words, let's forget about this one until the United Nations challenges on it. One can only say that they were looking at another prize, and this was considered a, a, a price that was worth paying because in reality there would be no objections and they would get away with it. And all they were concerned about, the documents show this quite clearly, all they were concerned about was whether they'd be found out. In that same month, the British representative at the United Nations, F.W.D. Brown, was instructed to lie to the General Assembly that the Chagos Islands were uninhabited when the United Kingdom first acquired them. I must remind you that this has been done in violation of the United Nations Charter. This is why it was done so uh, in absolute discretion and using lies. I'm not mincing my words. They were lies, damn lies. What the official documents show is not just a trail of lies, but an imperious attitude of brutality and contempt. In August of 1966, Sir Paul Gore Booth wrote, We must surely be very tough about this. The object of the exercise was to get some rocks which will remain ours. There will be no indigenous population except seagulls. At the end of this is a note handwritten by Dennis Greenhill, later Baron Greenhill of Harrow. Unfortunately, along with the birds go some few Tarzans or Men Fridays, whose origins are obscure, and who are being hopefully wished on to Mauritius, etc. When you look at the documents, here you've got some of your former colleagues talking about, well, we just need some rocks because in all that's on it are a bunch of Tarzans and a few Janes and, and all that. Well, yes. I mean, I, I, I know the person that you're referring to and the, and the uh, minute that you're referring to. Yeah. Uh, and I have the greatest respect for him. He's, he's dead now. Uh, and I'm sure that if he had any clue that, that his throwaway remarks would have become public, he would never have written that. Uh, because I don't believe he's that sort of person, frankly. Uh, you know, people... People put things in minutes on, on official papers that they don't really mean. <laughs>